Bueno. What? <laughs> Hey, y'all, we, uh, we are thankful that y'all uh, tuned in again for another Sunday morning online. We, uh, we again, want to ask that you participate with us this morning uh, as we sing, as we pray, as, as we just bring our worship to the Lord. Would you join with us? Open the word with us. Uh, let's just enjoy uh, being able to worship together, even though we're, we're scattered abroad. Let's just come together in the spirit this morning and, and be thankful for a Savior who loves us. Uh, would y'all pray with me? Lord, we thank you for this opportunity, God. We just pray right now, God, you would encourage hearts in, in hard times. God, we pray that your spirit would work and move, and, and Lord, we just thank you for your love and grace that sustains us. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.
Lamentations 3, verse 55 through 58. I called on your name, Lord, from the depths of the pit. You heard my plea. Do not close your ears to my cry for relief. You came near when I called you, and you said, do not fear. You, Lord, took up my case, and you redeemed my life. You are my joy. You are my song. You are the will, the one I'm drawn. want to take this time uh, again as we've done each and every week if we were here gathered as as we would like to be uh, during this time of our service we would uh, we'd bring our offerings to the Lord and so right now where you are however you're worshiping whether you're you're in the living room with the family you're sitting at the dining room table on a laptop whatever that looks like we just want to take this time to um, to bring our offerings to the Lord um, there's there's different ways you can do that if this is the first time you're watching us online um, you can go to our website, and you can go to the Give button, and you can give online that way. Um, you can also do it the old-fashioned way through snail mail, and uh, you can put your check in an envelope and mail it to the church at uh, P.O. Box 428, Valley Mills, Texas, 76689. But, you know, um, it's, it's, it's part of our worship to, to bring, bring our offerings to the Lord. He has blessed us with so much, and... Uh, you know, he, he calls us to bring our first and our best, and not because he needs it, 
but to draw us to him and to rely on him. And so pray with your family right now. Worship in this way with your family as, as, as we bring our offerings to the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are our provider. God, we continue to pray for healing. God, we pray for wisdom for so many. God, who are, who are dealing with so much. God, from government leaders all the way down to small business owners trying to figure out what to do and everything in between. And God, we, we just pray for your blessing. God, again, for your healing on this world. God, and may you use this time to draw us to you. God, we thank you for your many blessings, God, and we just bring back a portion of that to you, Lord, and we just ask that you would bless it, God, that you would help us to be good stewards of it, God, that we would use it wisely to share the gospel with the world through this ministry. We love you and we thank you. Amen. Philippians 3, verse 7 through 14. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I wanna know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, and straining toward what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There
when Christ shall come with shouts of Your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Till I lay my head oh, I will see of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so
Your goodness is running out. It's running out to me. Your goodness. Your goodness is running out. It's running out to me. Your goodness is running out. It's running. thank you that you are great and that you are good. God, no matter where we are, God, your, your goodness is chasing after us. God, you are our defender. God, you are our good God. No matter the circumstances, Lord, we know that you are good and we trust your promises. We trust you in faith, Lord. God, would you just speak through your word by your spirit's power now as we open up the Bible together, God, would you move among us? It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Well, again, we want to thank y'all for, uh, for tuning in this morning and uh, joining us uh, for worship on YouTube. Uh, I want to, again, I want to, I want to ask y'all to uh, lift up Greg and Casey, Betty and Charlie, uh, Ronnie and Sue as, as they're getting over their, their stuff and uh, hopefully uh, be out of quarantine uh, in the next couple of days. And, and Greg will be back with us next Sunday. <clears throat> I want to, uh, again, continue this Faith Over Fear series, and uh, if you've got your Bibles, and, and I, hope that, I hope that you've got your Bible with you or, or on your phone or something uh, with you as we worship and, and study the Word together this morning, turn uh, again to the, to the book of Hebrews. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 12, and uh, we're going to start in verse 18. And um, as y'all are turning there, when, uh, <clears throat> when Britt and I first got married, we had a great wedding. We were married New Year's Eve and um, <clears throat> have tons of friends and family there. It was, it was a great time. And, and then we went on our honeymoon and uh, it was awesome. We went to uh, Colorado and we went skiing and we stayed in this really nice resort and uh, it was right at the bottom of the mountain. And so we could basically just walk to the, to the lifts and, um, and, and we just, life was easy. For, for that week, it was it was worry free. There was I mean it was just it was just good. We were living the good life, 
And uh, when, when we got back from our honeymoon, I was supposed to start a new job. And uh, I had called the, the, the company that I was going to work for um, while we were on our honeymoon to let them know I'd got my dates mixed up and I needed to start a day later than what I had told them. And, and so uh, <clears throat> I left a message at the company to, to let them know that. And so when we get back, we get back to this little apartment that we, that we had rented uh, as a newlywed couple. It was government housing. It was tiny. It was small. It was, it was not nice. Um, and we get back, and we got no electricity. There was a, a mix-up with the power company, and, and of course, it's, it's never their fault. So our, our power got shut off for no reason, but then they wanted $400 to turn it back on. And uh, obviously, we, did, we didn't have that, because we was fresh married, young, and, 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 and poor. We were, we were very poor. And uh, anyways, and so... We, we get back, we've got, we've got no power in this little apartment, and then I go to work the next day, I walk in, and the owner of the company's standing there, and uh, he's just got this confused look on his face. And I figure he forgot who I was. And, uh, and so I said, hey, I'm Rob, I'm, I'm starting work today. And he said, no, 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 I, I know who you are, um, but you were supposed to start yesterday. And you didn't show up, so we filled the position. Um, I'm so sorry. And, uh, you know, if this, if this guy we hired doesn't work out, you'll be our first call. And I said, well, I, I left a message. He said, man, I'm sorry, we, we didn't get it. So we went from our honeymoon, literally the honeymoon, uh, just living the good life carefree, and overnight had no money, no electricity, and no job. And I just remember being overwhelmed with fear. You know, just, just a radical change of emotion where life is great, everything's going to be just fine, it's going to be perfect, and we get back and everything is wrong. And I just remember being overwhelmed with stress and anxiety and fear. Um, it, was, it, was, it was quite the change. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. The author of Hebrews has been building towards this passage the entire book. The first 11 chapters are pointing to this passage, this chapter. And the, the overall theme of Hebrews is that the old has been fulfilled. The old covenant has been fulfilled by a new covenant which is in the blood of Christ. So where the old covenant, you had the priests that, that were constantly standing and performing their religious duties. Jesus comes and fulfills the, as the great high priest. He comes and offers one sacrifice and because it fulfills all sacrifices, He sits down at the right hand of the Father because it's done, it's fulfilled. The old sacrificial system where sacrifices had to be made over and over and over because of sin has been fulfilled in His once and for all sacrifice. The old is fulfilled with the new and, and, it, and it all leads to chapter 12. <clears throat> and in chapter 12, we see this main point of Hebrews that the old is fulfilled by the new and the author does this by contrasting two different mountains. You have the mountain of fear and the mountain of faith. Look at verse 18. It says, You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Would you pray with me? Lord God, open our hearts and our minds, I pray right now, for us to understand the truth of Your Word. God, may it transform us from the inside out and draw us near to You. It's in Your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. So here in these opening verses that we're going to look at, we've got the mountain of fear. And it says, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched, that's burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm. The author here is referring to the Old Covenant. He's re referring to Mount Sinai. The mountain of fear is in the Old Testament. You've got this Mount Sinai. If you remember uh, in Exodus, God rescues the people. He brings them out of bondage from Egypt, and He takes them through the wilderness to, to the desert of Sinai, and, and they park there at the bottom of the mountain. And God tells Moses, 
I'm going to descend on this mountain. My presence is going to be on this mountain. And he says, you need to guard this mountain. Don't let anyone touch it because if they touch it, when my presence is resting on this mountain, they have to be put to death. He says so much so that not just people, but if an unclean animal wanders up on this mountain, that animal has to be stoned to death because of God's holiness descending on that mountain, His presence on that mountain. This is the place where God establishes His covenant with Israel. It's the place where God gives Moses the Ten Commandments and the Law, and Moses then distributes those to the people. And in Exodus chapter 20, we see the people's reaction to God descending on the mountain. It says, When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us or we will die. We see in verse 20 here in, in Hebrews 12 that it says they couldn't bear what was commanded. And it's not talking about the Ten Commandments but it's talking about this command that don't let anyone touch this mountain or they got to be stoned to death. They couldn't bear to recognize that they were unclean and God was so holy. They didn't want to even hear His voice. They said, Moses, you go talk to God, but we can't, we can't handle it. We'll surely die. And though they were right to tremble, in awe at the power and and holiness of God, notice this, they let their fear drown out the voice of God. They let their fear lead them to not listen to what He said. But the key verse is verse 18. He says, You have not come to a mountain that can be touched that's burning with fire. And the you there is believers. Believers have not come. Believers in Jesus Christ, those who have put their faith in Jesus, have not come to the mountain of fear. We've come to the mountain of faith. Look at verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the Spirit of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. We've come to the mountain of faith as believers in Jesus Christ. This is Mount Zion, it says. We, we, we hear Mount Zion re, um, referred to. We hear this place Zion referred to throughout Scripture. <clears throat> what is it? It's the place where God dwells. It's the place where we are headed as believers. This mountain of faith. He says, you haven't come to the mountain that can be touched there uh, with the old covenant, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Notice this. He says, you've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. And then later he says, you've come to God, the judge of all. We have come to the city of the living God. We've come, as we said last week, we have come to the, we, we can come through God's grace to His throne room with confidence, not in fear. He says we've come to the church of the firstborn. We've come to Jesus in the new covenant by His blood. But notice this. It says God is still judge of all. It's not that you've got this one God personality over here and God has a totally different personality on Mount Zion. It's not that on Mount Sinai, God is mean and then He decides on Mount Zion He's going to be nice. It's the same God. He's still judge of all on this mountain. But notice the difference. It says it's a joyful assembly. Not fearful. Why? Because of the new covenant, it says. Made through the blood of Christ. And it ends there with Jesus' blood saying that it speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. What does that mean? If you remember back in Genesis chapter 4, Cain kills his brother Abel and God comes to Cain and he says, Cain, where's your brother? And, and, and Cain says, I don't know. I'm not my brother's keeper. Am, am I my brother's keeper? Why, why, do I, why are you asking me? And God says, what have you done? Your brother's blood cries out from the ground. The blood that, that, that speaks or, or 
excuse me, the word that, that Abel's blood speaks is this. Punishment needs to be made. There is an offender that needs judgment. But the blood of Christ speaks a better word. It speaks this. Punishment has been taken upon me. And the offender receives pardon. So the blood of Jesus is how we access the presence of God. In confidence, we come to the mountain of faith, not fear. And then notice in verse 25, he says this, See to it that you do not refuse Him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused Him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from Him who warns us from heaven? We've got to pay attention to His voice. It's a warning for us all. He says, if they didn't escape, if they didn't escape when they refused Him who warned them on earth, again, going back to Mount Sinai, and this, this idea that there was no escape. If you came into the presence of God, if you touched the mountain and were not clean and were not consecrated, weren't invited, there was no escape. You were put to death. And he says, how much less will we if we refuse, if we turn away from the One who warns us from heaven? What's this warning? It's this that our only hope of reaching the mountain of faith, of reaching Zion, the heavenly city, for all eternity, is in Christ. Our only hope is the good news of the Gospel. That Jesus made the sacrifice on our behalf. That He took the punishment that we deserve. That He took our place on the cross and on the third day walked out of that grave, proving that God had accepted the payment on our behalf. That's our only hope, is to put our faith in His blood to cover our sins. And he says, do not refuse Him. Do not refuse Him. The Gospel is this, that we recognize that we have a sinful heart from birth and we need rescue. And our only rescue is through the Savior Jesus Christ and putting our faith in His work on the cross and His resurrection that proved that it worked. Look at verse 26. He goes on to say this, At that time His voice shook the earth, but now He has promised, Once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. He says once more, he's, he's quoting the prophet Haggai in the Old Testament. And he says he, he shook the earth at, at that time, again, referring to the old, referring to Mount Sinai when the mountain shook because the presence of God had descended upon it. But he says, but there's going to be another time. And when he says once more, he gives commentary here. It's not that like once again, here, here we go again, God's going to come, but it's, it's pointing to a once and final time the day of judgment when God won't speak from just from a mountain, but He says He will speak and shake the earth and the heavens, and that all created things will fall away. Everything that is temporary will be gone on that moment when God speaks that once and final time and shakes the earth and the heavens. The good news for us is that for those who um, have placed their faith and trust in Jesus, when God speaks at that moment and shakes the earth and the heavens, those who are in Christ, the things that fall away includes our fear and our suffering. And we join Him on the mountain of faith, mountain of joy. So the question is, are we listening to that warning? Are we listening to that voice that calls us to Him? Or have we let the voice of God be drowned out in the midst of our different fears. He quotes the prophet Haggai here. I want to flip over to the Old Testament, to the book of Haggai. And uh, if you're not familiar with Haggai, if you remember, we, we studied Habakkuk not too long ago. And um, <clears throat> if you go to Habakkuk, then you have Zephaniah and then Haggai. It's a, it's a small book, just a couple of chapters. 
But the author of Hebrews quotes him here in this statement of once more God's going to shake the heavens and the earth. I want to look at Haggai chapter 1, starting in verse 2. And what's taken place is the people of God have been in exile. They've been in slavery. They were conquered by the Babylonians and they were carried off um, to captivity. But God promised them that after a season of 70 years, He would restore them, that He would bring them back to their land. And that's what has taken place. The Persians come in and, and they, they overtake Babylon. And the king of Persia has favor on God's people and he says, I'm going to let you go back. Take the things that were removed from the temple. Go back and rebuild the temple that was destroyed by the Babylonians. And so Haggai is around. He's a prophet of God during this time. Look at verse 2. It says, This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? The people were restored to their land. They were, they were able to go back and uh, the, the temple had been leveled. And in the book of Ezra, which goes alongside these times, you have the prophet Ezra talk about the people came back and they began work on the temple. As soon as they got back, they laid the foundation. And once they laid the foundation of the temple, they had a huge worship service. And they celebrated that they were back in their land and that the temple would one day be restored. The temple was everything because it's where the presence of God dwelt among His people. It's where they worshipped Him. It's where He joined with them on earth. And so they come back, they lay the foundation, and they're excited they have this huge worship service. And then the enemies of, uh, of the people of God around there get wind of what's going on, and they come and they begin to torment them. In Ezra chapter 4, it says this, Then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid. So much so, it says that not only did they, did they oppose them there, but they also sent word to the, to the Persian king that said, you need to rethink about uh, what you're doing because these, these, these Jews will, will build this temple and then they will revolt against you. They'll cause a rebellion. And so the king listens to them and he sends an envoy that tells them and, and, and tells them by force they are not allowed to continue the work on the temple. And in Ezra 4.24... It says, thus the work on the house of God in Jerusalem came to a standstill. And that's where we are in the book of Haggai here. God asks them this question because their excuse is it's not the right time. They let the fear of those opposing them, the enemies of God's people who said don't do it, that, that, that caused them to be afraid, they let that fear overtake them. And for six years, they, they, didn't, they didn't put a stone towards the temple. They said, now's not the right time. We'll get to it later. And God asked them this question. Is it time for you? Because you're living in these nice finished out houses while the house of God remains in ruin. So my question to us is what causes you to say the time has not yet come. Is there fear in your life that causes you to say, now's not the right time. One day I'll get to that business that the Lord has called me to, but right now is just not the right time. I need to focus on some other things. Living in fear will lead to excuses to ignore the Word and the work. See, their entire purpose, the whole reason that they were set free and, and came back to Jerusalem was to rebuild the temple. The whole purpose in coming back home was to rebuild the temple of God, but after discouraging opposition, they abandoned the difficult work of God for disappointing self-comfort. God goes on to say through the prophet in verse 5, He says, Now this is what the Lord Almighty says, Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. 
This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. The Lord, um, through this time, has given us an opportunity to give careful thought to our ways. Don't waste this time. Evaluate your life. Notice what he says here. He says, you, you, you've spent all this time planning, but you're not harvesting anything. You continually consume, but you're never filled up. You work and work and work for wages that go into a purse that's full of holes. He says, give careful thought to your ways. And He has given us a time right now where we can give some careful thought to our lives and ask the question, what are we gaining from all this stuff in our life? Because that's what God is initially or, or essentially saying here. So you're doing all this stuff, but is it, really, is it really profiting you in any way? Is there any benefit to what you are consumed with in your life? Just give careful thought to your ways. In verse 8, he tells them this. He says, Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. He says, my house remains a ruin while you're busy with your own house. To, uh, to quote my daddy-in-law, I heard him recently say, say this, can, can I play Mr. Rogers for a second and get all up in your neighborhood? What God says here, is my house is in ruins and yet your houses are finished out. You have ignored the work of God to build your own life over here and acted like I'm not even present, that I don't even have a plan. The question for us is, has, has being busy with our own house caused us to justify ignoring the Lord? Has being busy building our own lives caused us to ignore God's will for our lives? Jesus tells us this in Mark chapter 8. He says, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? We're familiar with that passage, I think. Notice it doesn't say, if you want to be my disciple, you should deny yourself. It doesn't say, if you want to be my disciple, you might deny yourself. He says, anyone who wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, must take up their cross, and must follow me. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? And I think a lot of times we don't do these things because of fear. We fear denying ourselves anything because we want it all. We fear taking up our cross because we don't, we don't think life should not be um, easy. We want to be comfortable, and a cross is not comfortable. And, and we fear following Jesus because He might take us down a road we don't want to go, like He told Peter. And so instead of denying ourselves, taking up our cross and following Jesus, we say, now's not the right time. I'll get to it later. I'm kind of busy over here with my own house. Because of fear. But the prophet here gives us a, a recipe to overcome that fear. Look again at verse 8. He says, Go up into the mountains, bring down timber, and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored. The recipe to overcome fear is we're to go, we're to bring, and we're to build. Notice what he says. He says, Go up into the mountain." Bring back the timber. Bring back the material and get to work. Go, bring, and build. As believers, when we are overcome with fear, we need to faithfully go do what God has called us to do. Go, take the Gospel to the nations. 
bring people to Jesus, to our, to our Savior whom we love, and build His kingdom by His power. We want to overcome fear. We go by faith. We bring by faith. And we build upon faith. God tells them this in verse 10. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces, on people and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. He says, because you've ignored what I've called you to do, and you focused on your own house, he says, I'm going to help you out. Notice what he says to him. He says, I called for a drought. But not just on the field, he says. I called for a drought on the field, on the mountains, on the grain, on the new wine, on the olive oil. Everything that the ground produces on people, on livestock, and on all the labor of your hand. God brings everything, he brings it all to a standstill. Does that sound familiar? That in the midst of all of this, God says, okay, let me have your attention. He says, I called for a famine on it all. All the way to, to, to the labor of your hands. He brings it all to a standstill. Call them back to Him. Now, as I said last week, God is doing a, a million different things through what's going on in the world right now. But I think one of the things that he is doing is calling believers out of their comfort. Out of, of this idea that we can say, I'll get to it later. We've been lulled to sleep by our comfort and, and by the things that, that, that we want to consume and we've ignored the work of God that he's put us here to do. And so I think one of the things that God is doing right now is he's giving us a time to reevaluate our lives to realize that we haven't been giving careful thought to our ways. And He's drawing us back to Him. We see in verses 12-15 through 15 that the people respond correctly. They repent and they obey and they get back to work. Look at what it says in chapter 2, verse 4. It says, But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josadak the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. For I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted you with, with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. They get back to work, and this is what God says. He says, be strong and work, because I'm with you. Do not fear. He, he, he lists three people there. Zerubbabel was from the line of David. He would have been king if they weren't under Persian rule. So he's the governor that's been sent with them. <clears throat> and then we've got the high priest. And then we've got the people. But he tells each one of them, be strong. The message is for prince, priest, and people. No matter if you're the king, if you're the priest, or if you're just a commoner, we all must rely on God's strength to do the work. And the good news is, is look what he reminds them of. He says, I covenanted with you. When you came out of Egypt, he's going back to Sinai. He's talking about my, Mount Sinai, where he gave them the law, and he said, I will be your God, and you will be my people. And he says, though you have, you have wandered away at times, you have not kept your end of the bargain, he says, I am faithful and I will always remain. My spirit remains. I am with you. God has not abandoned you in this time. No matter what you're facing, whether it's a health issue, whether it's an employment issue, whatever it is, He is faithful. He has not abandoned you in this time. So do not fear. And the final thing, verse 6, this is what the Lord Almighty says, in a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations will come. I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. 
the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. He has not abandoned you, so do not fear. Notice in those three verses, over and over and over, declares the Lord Almighty, says the Lord Almighty. We serve a God who is all mighty no matter the circumstance and he says that this is all pointing to a greater glory god's concern is not simply with a physical temple but he is pointing to the ultimate temple the fulfillment of the old temple in the new temple which is jesus christ and he says in this place i will give what all nations desire a deliverer and in this place i will grant peace it's all pointing to jesus He is the fulfillment of everything that the temple was about. From the priesthood to the sacrificial system, He fulfills it all. He's talking about the mountain of faith. He's talking about Zion. We first hear about Zion in 2 Samuel chapter 5. When David defeats the Jebusites at the fortress of Zion, and it becomes the city of David, Jerusalem, right there in the same area. And we see it talked about over and over throughout Scripture until we get to Revelation 21. Go and read Revelation 21 this week. And it describes the heavenly city that is full of joy and peace. <clears throat> it says there's not even, the, the sun isn't even needed because the glory of God lights up everything. That's where we're headed for those who are in Christ. We haven't been abandoned. We don't need to fear because we serve the Lord Almighty who through Jesus Christ is leading us to Him. Go back to Hebrews and I'll finish with these last two verses. Chapter 12, verse 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. For those who are in Christ, we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Nothing can shake it. No circumstance can shake it. No virus can shake it. No suffering can shake it. We have faith over fear because we no longer have to visit Mount Sinai. Fearing the wrath of God, we're on our way to the kingdom of Jesus by grace through faith in Him. And no matter what we're facing, He says, I am with you. Do not fear. So for us, we're told here, let us worship the Lord with thanks and faithfully follow and do what He's called us to do, which is to go which is to bring and to build in faith, not fear. You know, when when we got back from our honeymoon and and everything kind of fell apart, I was was overwhelmed with fear. And just thinking, what are we going to do? How are we going to survive? And I think two fears were realized in that moment. One was the obvious fear. I I didn't know how we were going to make it. And I felt all this pressure to be able to provide for, for me and Britt and, and just thinking, what are we going to do? How are we, how are we going to make it? So there's that obvious fear. But what I've realized looking back is there was another fear that was revealed. That we had spent this week of just living the easy life and everything was perfect and comfortable and, and, and great. And all of a sudden I had a fear that Life couldn't be good if it wasn't like that. And the truth of the matter is, now, though that fear when we came back was real and I was overwhelmed by it, looking back from this point now, I look back on that time with joy, if that makes sense. I, I, I think about the struggle and just, we were young and dumb and, and, and poor, but yet, I see how God used that time to draw me close to my wife. How He used that time to build a reliance on Him that that I needed to have to be able to get through life. He reminded me that He has not abandoned me. 
And so from this place, I look back with joy seeing not the suffering, not the fear, but looking at how God carried me through that, carried me and my wife through that, never abandoned us. One day, because of Jesus, because we have placed our faith in Him and we follow Him, we're going to look back from the mountain of faith with joy, even in the suffering, because we're going to see that He never abandoned us, that He carried us, that though we were afraid, our fears were no match for Him, and that He carried us through to faith. So right now, if you're feeling fearful, my prayer for you is that you would recognize that fear and that you would carry it to Him. That you would remind yourself of the promise of God that He will not abandon you no, abandon you no matter the circumstance. And that we don't have to fear because He is with us. Let's pray. Lord God, I come to You right now thanking You that You are Almighty God. God, that You have defeated every fear. God, and by the blood of Jesus, we can approach You in peace, in joy, in love, and in faith. Lord, I pray for us God, in this time, would we evaluate our lives? God, would we look and see? God, would we not make excuses? But Lord, would we do Your work? God, would You wake us up from our slumber, from our laziness? God, would You draw us out to do the work that You've called us to do, that You've put us here to do? God, may we do it in joy. God, in suffering, may You remind us, God, that You are with us. Lord, I lift up our church that is... is not able to meet physically right now, God, would you continue to sustain them by your grace? God, would you continue to, to shape us and mold us through this time? God, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. the 
y'all so much for joining us this week. We want to pray that you have a, have a great week and continue to lift up Greg and his family in prayers as they're healing up and he should be back next week. But let's sing Jesus Loves Me together and we'll be done. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the We are Saddle Up.
Good job.